In this tutorial, we're going to learn about HATOS. No, that's not a typo. That's actually an acronym. H-A-T-E-O-A-S. Probably in the running for the worst acronym ever. It stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State. I know, worst acronym ever, huh? But bear with me and you'll soon, soon understand what this means. So, Maybe you remember, I mentioned in the first video in the series that there is no service definition specification for REST APIs. There's no formal document that really documents uh, the API itself. Most REST APIs have help pages that explain what the API URIs are and what the operations are that are supported. I also mentioned in the first video that the best RESTful APIs don't even need any documentation. and uh, now I'll explain what I mean by that. We visit websites all the time, right? So when was the last time you looked up any documentation to use a website? Well, never, I hope. You don't need any documentation to visit and use websites, right? You just go to the homepage, and when you go to the homepage, you'll find links to other pages. And we click on one such link, you'll get to that page with more links, right? You don't need a documentation or a help guide to know where to go. You just remember the website address, home address, and any other links that you will need to navigate the site will be provided to you in the response. This is basically the advantage of using HTTP. Remember that HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. We've discussed that hypertext is text that has links to other text. These links, which are called hyperlinks, are what's really handy to navigate your way through any site, right? Most sites have these hyperlinks, and that's what lets you go from page to page, and that's what lets you use any website effectively. Now, let's think about the response we return in a REST API. What if we implement the same concept here? Let's say you receive a GET request from a client for a message ID, right? Messages slash a particular message ID. We return that message information in XML or JSON. Now, what if you could also send links to the comment resource URIs, right? And likes and share resource URIs. So it's basically the server saying, hey client, I know you asked for message ID 20. Now here's the contents of message ID 20. By the way, I'm also throwing in the collection resource URI for comments, likes, and shares for message ID 20. So if you need a list of all the comments for message ID 20, that's the URI to use. If you need a list of shares, that's the URI to use. If you need a list of likes, that's the URI to use. Oh, and by the way, this is the profile resource URI for the author of the message. If you need more details on the author, this is the URI to use, right? So the web service is basically being super helpful to the client by providing all these links in the response. It's similar to hyperlinks in websites. Whether the client wants to use it or not doesn't matter, but if they want it, it's there, okay? So the client developer just picks up the value of the right URI from the previous response and makes subsequent calls to those URIs. And when the subsequent response comes in, that'll have further URIs that the client could be interested in, right? So if you do this, you don't let the client programmer have to know and hard code these URIs in order to interact with the resources and the application state. So you basically let the hypertext you send in the response, the hypermedia that you send in the response, drive the client's interaction with the application state, right? So you could say that the hypertext or hypermedia, as it's sometimes called, being the driver or the engine of the application state. Hypermedia as the engine of application state. This is HATOS, H-A-T-O-A-S, okay? Does that make sense now? It's still a bad choice for the name, I agree, but at least it should make some sense now. By the way, I'm not sure what the official pronunciation of this acronym is. I call it HATOS. You can call it whatever you want, but this is what it means. Okay, now let's walk through a scenario so that this concept becomes clearer. Let's start with the slash messages collection URI. Accessing slash messages should give you a list of messages in the system. Let's say a message representation has the following fields, right? The message ID, 
the actual content of the message, the message author who posted that message and the posted date, right? Four simple properties. A JSON representation for a sample message would look something like this. Let's say this is message ID one. So it has the ID value, it has the content, which is the body of the message, it has the author who posted it, apparently that's me, and the posted date, which is when I posted it. Now, when you access the slash messages collection URI, you basically get a collection of such message resources. So this is one message resource. So if you access slash messages, you get like a bunch of these message instances. To keep it simple, let's say there are just three messages in the system right now, okay? Now, if you access slash messages, you'd get something like this, right? You have three message representations as a list, right? Because this is all there is in the system at this point. Now that the client has a list of messages, let's say they want the details of the first message, message ID one, okay? They want to know what the resource URIs, let's say they want an updater or something like that. So they need to know what the instance resource URI is so that they can make a put request to that URI. We have already designed that URI to be slash messages slash message ID, okay? So to get this URI, what they would have to do is, they've, they've already got this response, right? They've made a call to slash messages and they've got this response. What they need to do is take the message that they're interested in, okay? Take the ID value, they look at the ID property, get the value, so they take that and they append it to the string slash messages slash, okay? So they do a slash messages slash and then they append that ID value and there they have the resource URI. But this means that the client will have to know this beforehand, right? They need to know to pick up that ID, which is one of the properties beforehand and they need to know what to append it to, which is this hard-coded string. As an API service implementer, but here's a question. Why not send that whole URI to the client yourself? Since we are sending the message resource details anyway, why not just construct the URI fully and send it to the client? Consider a sample response for a single message like this. It's exactly the same as what we saw before, but it has one extra property. It has a property called href, which contains the link to that message resource instance, okay? If this were to be the kind of response for every message in slash messages, then the client wouldn't have to do any URI construction. They wouldn't have to construct the URI like we just discussed. The resource URI is one of the properties of the resource. So if you were to design an API, it's such a way that every resource representation has a property which is the instance resource URI to itself, think about how convenient it would be for the client to use, right? Okay, so notice that the name of the link property is href. This must be familiar. This is exactly how you specify links in HTML, right? href is a property of the A tag, the anchor tag, which contains the URL, right? This serves a similar purpose here. With this idea, we're actually on our way to implementing some of the Hato's concepts. We're not fully there yet, there's still some more things to learn. Let's look at the concept of links and how we can apply them to resources in the Messenger API. We've looked at adding the resource URI to every resource, right? So a profile resource or a comment resource or well, pretty much any resource could have a href attribute that has a value of the instance resource URI of itself. But that's not the only link that you can provide. For instance, a message resource could also have links to get all the comments for that message, okay? And all the likes and shares for that message. You could even have links for the client to post a new comment to that message, right? If you extend this, it could get a bit messy, right? Now look at this response. You have all these different properties. If you do this, the client doesn't need to remember the URIs, yes, but now they'll have to remember all the property values for these URIs, the property names, uh, so that it gets the right value. And you basically have the same problem. There needs to be a better way to manage these links. And there is. You can use 
the rel attribute. If you've used anchor tags when writing HTML, the A tags when writing HTML, you might have encountered this rel attribute before. It's basically an attribute that you can add to any link to specify the relationship between the current document and the link document. The most common example for rel is stylesheet links. Uh, you would have seen stylesheet links in HTML head tags like this, right? The href here provides the actual URL being linked and then the rel attribute describes the relation of that link to the main document. Here the relation is that the link is a style sheet of the main document. So we can use the rel attribute to add extra information in the links in our rest response. Here's the original href response modified with the new rel attribute addition. Okay, so you have links as a property which contains one instance, right? It's an array which contains one object, which is the href, which has the link, and then the rel, which says self, right? We've introduced this new property. Now this is going to contain all the links that you want to embed in the response, right? You add a rel attribute to make it clear what that link points to, right? Rel points to self, which indicates that here, the link in the resource is pointing to itself. This could be extended by adding new links and assigning the right rel values for each, right? You could have assigned the appropriate rel values. So let's say you want to add a link for getting all the comments. So you could add a href, which is another element in this links attribute. And the rel could be comments. You want to add the likes URL, you could add that as a href and the rel for that would be likes and shares and so on. You could also have profiles and then the rel for that would be the profiles or the author or something like that. If you do this, now the client doesn't have to remember the link property name, right? They just have to find the link with the right rel value for the resource that they want, and then they just look up the href for that link. Okay, a couple of things to note here. While the concept of having URIs in the response to achieve HATOS is something that's well understood, and it's mostly agreed upon by all, the way to do this could differ drastically depending on the implementation, right? The format of JSON that I've outlined here is just one of the multitude of ways in which you could structure these links. Again, there's no right or wrong. Uh, you can choose to tweak how you want to present the links in your JSON response depending on your preference and depending on your client's ease of use. Secondly, the rel attribute here is a part of the HTTP specification. So there are only certain standard values that are allowed for it. There is a link in the description which lists the available values. And obviously the rel value here, like comments and likes are not actual standardized values, but we'll still use it. Like I mentioned before, the idea is to have an API that's easy for the clients to use and it's easy for you to maintain. You don't wanna to focus too much on getting things right and going by the book at least not at the cost of complicating the API too much. Okay, in summary, HATOS is a way to provide links to resources in the API response so that the client doesn't have to deal with the URI construction and the business flow. They make a request and the next steps along with the URIs for the next steps are handed to them in the response. When you write APIs, you can choose to add these URIs using the href attribute. They can also provide more information about the relationship to the link resource using the rel attribute. I hope the concepts are clear and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.